up on this Wednesday edition of Newsline at noon, Korea is putting the finishing touches on its preparations for a landmark visit by Pope Francis, who lands in Seoul Thursday for his first trip to Asia as pontiff. Opposition demands for the renegotiation of an agreement reached last week on a probe into the April ferry disaster forces another parliamentary deadlock, holding up crucial legislation needed to implement President Peck's reforms. Plus, the number of Koreans finding work rebounds after four months of slowdown, fueling hopes of an economic recovery. These stories and more on Newsline at Noon. It's noon Wednesday, August 13th here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in. Live from Seoul, I'm Ajin Ju. It's very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. We're now just one day away from the start of Pope Francis's highly anticipated and historic five-day visit to Korea. It will mark the Pope's first trip to Asia as pontiff and the first papal visit to Korea since Pope John Paul II came back in 1989. Now, Pope Francis has very little downtime in his schedule. For a rundown on where the pontiff will be and who he will meet during his stay, here's our Hwang Jie. Pope Francis won't be wasting any time upon his arrival in Korea on Thursday morning. After a short welcoming ceremony, he will head to the presidential office and meet President Park Geun-hye. On Friday, the Pope will head to Daejeon to lead a mass at the city's World Cup stadium. There, he will console bereaved families and victims of April's Sewolho ferry disaster. On Saturday morning, the Pope will visit Seosomun Martyrs Shrine, where the largest number of Catholics were executed in the 19th century. After paying respect at the shrine, he will parade through Gwanghamun Square to beatify 124 Korean martyrs. Beatification is a declaration by the Pope as the head of the church that the deceased faithfully lived a holy life and are now dwelling in heaven. And it's no coincidence that the ceremony is taking place in the heart of Seoul, where the justice ministry was located around 200 years ago. The Pope starts from where the martyrs lived their final moments and goes back to where they were declared sinners to beatify them. He is correcting the past and trying to heal the history of the persecution of Catholics. On Sunday, he will lead a concluding mass for the 6th Asian Youth Day at Hemi Fortress, located in the nation's southwest region. Around 2,000 young Catholics from 23 different Asian countries and some 4,000 young Korean Catholics will take part. On the morning of his last day in Korea, the Pope will hold a mass for peace and reconciliation at Seoul's Myeongdong Cathedral. Many expect the Pope to convey a message of hope and healing to those who are poor and marginalized, as his visit also includes meeting with the victims of Japan's wartime sexual slavery, laid-off workers from Korea's Sangyong Motor, and a trip to a rehabilitation center called Kotongne. The Pope will fly back to Rome next Monday afternoon. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. And on to our next story. The political bickering rages on in Korea's National Assembly over a bill designed to get to the bottom of what caused and who is to blame for the sinking of the Seoul Ferry back in April. Now, the ruling party wants to go with the terms agreed last week, but the main opposition party and the families of the victims want to overturn the agreement and are demanding the fact-finding panel to be given the right to hold investigative powers and prosecute those deemed responsible. Chimin Gil reports. The special Seoul Ferry bill aims to create an inquiry panel that will determine the exact cause of the deadly sinking in mid April, which left 304 people dead or missing. The rival parties disagree on whether to give the inquiry panel prosecutorial powers, meaning the bill has been sat in limbo for weeks. The ruling's Henry party is against the idea of giving the inquiry panel prosecutorial powers and says the time for negotiations is over. I'm speechless. What are we getting out of this political deadlock? What's the essence of democracy? 
What are we going to say to our future generations? Senator Party lawmakers say that giving such overreaching powers to authorities other than state prosecutors would set a dangerous precedent. Prosecutorial powers refer to special legal prerogatives, such as the right to ask the courts for search warrants or detain suspects. The main opposition party, New Politics Alliance for Democracy, and the bereaved families say the panel will be unable to reveal the root causes of the disaster without such powers and blame the bill's delay on the ruling party. Our party has been trying to offer leadership to the parliament. I've tried to break the impasse and have done my best to cooperate. Last week's compromise between rival parties' floor leaders did not give the inquiry panel legal powers, which prompted the victims' families and some opposition lawmakers to demand the deal be nullified. If the political discord continues, the ruling party may find it much more difficult to pass urgent bills, while the opposition party could be facing yet another leadership crisis. Kim young Arirang News. The world's leading mathematicians have descended on Seoul for this year's International Congress of Mathematicians. President Beck Geun-hye addressing the global conference underscored the importance of math in our everyday lives and called on participants to make it a little less intimidating for the rest of us. Chiu Sun has the story. It's the first time Korea is hosting the International Congress of Mathematicians, which has been held every four years since 1897. Organizers of the Seoul Congress say Korea's rapid development in the field of mathematics was a major reason it was awarded the global event. This was also reflected in the decision to have a Korean mathematician deliver a keynote speech. Under the slogan, Dreams and Hopes for Late Starters, this year's host nation has also offered grants to nearly 1,000 mathematicians from developing countries so they can participate. President Park geun at the opening ceremony highlighted the role mathematics plays in the development of humanity. The president also talked about the need to bridge the gap between the academia of mathematics and the general public. 수학이 수학자들만의 학문이 아니라 미래를 이끌어갈 젊은이들과 일반 대중들이 친근하게 접하고 이해할 수 있는 학문으로 발전해 가기를 기대하고 있습니다. To achieve that very goal, a list of events, such as a special lecture by James Simons, a mathematician turned hedge fund manager, and an open meeting with a laureate of the Congress's Distinguished Fields Medal are lined up. The event will run at COEX Southern Seoul until August 21st. Choi Yusun, Arirang News. The Korean government has designated 150 new tasks to be tackled involving mostly safety issues following heightened safety concerns in the wake of April Shoto ferry sinking. Prime Minister Chung Hong Wan presided over a meeting on Tuesday with the Office for Government Policy Coordination and selected 150 areas to be scrutinized for improvement. Among the 90 areas related to safety, vigilance at schools, daycare centers, and senior homes will be strengthened and food safety and sanitation will also come under special attention. In the industrial sector, companies will be asked to ensure the safety of their infrastructure to prevent ground sinking or structure collapses. Measures to eradicate illegal online gambling and offshore tax evasion are expected to be beefed up as well. Currently, a total of 95 tasks are being addressed following President Park's vow to normalize irregularities in society. A statue that honors the tens of thousands of Korean women who were used as sex slaves by Japanese soldiers before and during World War II can and will remain in the U.S. city of Glendale. The, the Los Angeles Times reports that a federal judge dismissed a lawsuit on the removal 
of that monument last week, the judge decided that the Japanese-American plaintiffs did not prove sufficiently that they have suffered from the placement of the statue in the city's main park. Uh, since the installment last summer, the memorial statue has been at the centre of debate, but city officials and the vast majority of residents wanted to stay where it is. According to historians, roughly 200,000 women and girls, mostly Korean, but also from elsewhere in Asia, were rounded up and forced into brothels and raped by Japanese soldiers. Now, Japan is looking to establish 10 inhabited remote islands near its uh, national borders, a special border remote islands, and to really promote the island's protection and also their development. According to Japanese government sources, a bill that's likely to be submitted to parliament this fall will call on the government in Tokyo to construct self-defense force facilities on these islands. Candidates for special border remote islands include the Oki Islands uh, in Japan. These islands, the Oki Islands, are about 160 kilometers away from Korea's Dokdo Island, which uh, Japan keeps making false territorial claims to. Meanwhile, on a semi-related note, Japan's Kyodo News Agency reported on Tuesday that over 100 senior maritime self-defense force officers paid a visit to the Yasukuni War Shrine back in May. Korea and China and some other countries as well see the shrine as a celebration of Japan's past militarism as several Class A war criminals are laid to rest there. Now, a group of Japanese firms are planning a test flight next year for the nation's first ever homegrown stealth fighter jet. The consortium led by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries is reportedly developing a jet that is made up of similar technology to the US-made F-35 stealth fighters. Our Kim ji reports. This is Japan's new generation of stealth fighter jets, the Shinshin. It's 14 meters long and equipped with double engines to produce extra lift and power control mid-air. It's largely aimed at rivaling the stealth capability of China's fighter jets, the Zen-20, which will be combat-ready in 2017. The latest model, manufactured by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, is being prepared for flight experiments in January of next year, and the Japanese Defense Ministry said it's expected to put them into use by the year 2030. Up until now, airplanes faced risks of damage if the front part tilted upwards. However, with the alteration of the exhaust system, the new model is designed to fly fast even if the front part tilted upwards. The development of high-tech weaponry by the Japanese government is being met with concerns that it will trigger an arms race in Northeast Asia, already plagued with unresolved territorial and historical spats. It also comes as Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party plans to propose a bill to expand the range of military activity of its self-defense forces in the region. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Stay up to date on the latest news out of Korea. Connecting to our team of reporters about the issues that matter to Korea. On air, on your mobile, online. Find out more about Korea on Newsline at Noon with Mark Broom and Ah oh Jin-ju. Even when I'm Ah oh Jin-ju. Market researcher, strategy analytics said Thursday that LG Electronics we have some positive news on the nation's economic front. The number of new jobs rebounded in July after shrinking for the four previous months, fueling hopes of a pickup in the nation's economic recovery. Statistics Korea said on Wednesday job growth topped 500,000 in July from less than 400,000 in June after peaking at 835,000 in February. Employment improved particularly in the manufacturing, retail and construction sectors. The jobless rate, meanwhile, inched up 0.3 percentage points to 3.4 percent in July as more people actively sought jobs. Young job seekers in particular are still facing tough conditions, with the jobless rate among those aged 15 to 29 standing at 8.9 percent. 
Now, will the central bank's monetary policy committee slash its key interest rate at its monthly meeting tomorrow? Well, a rate cut is widely expected, and if it comes, it'll be the first movement in 15 months and would suggest the Bank of Korea is falling in line with the finance ministry's efforts to stimulate the economy. Sun Jung-in has more. Among economists is a widely held belief that the Bank of Korea will cut its benchmark interest rate at Thursday's Monetary Policy Committee. Now the focus is on by how much. Reflecting the expectations, the yield on three-year government debt has slid over the last couple of months, inching closer to the key interest rate. According to polls, 8 out of 10 financial experts estimate that a cut of 0.25 percentage points would push the benchmark Kospi index up by 60 to 70 points. If the government and the central bank fail to cooperate on lowering the interest rate, the effects of new policy measures to boost the economy may be in vain in the short term. Pundits speculate that central bank Governor E. Jr. gave the signal to cut the rate at the policy meeting last month. However, there are concerns that a rate cut may not be as effective as many anticipate and that it won't help to address swelling household debt, which has now surpassed one trillion U.S. dollars. A lower interest rate causes an increase in household debt, so a rate cut may help the economy in the short term. But there are potential risk factors that could lead to more household debt in the future. That puts the Bank of Korea in a tough spot. Another rate freeze will almost certainly trigger criticism over not working in step with market policy, while an interest rate cut without offering clear reasoning may mean lost trust from the public over the abrupt decision. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Korean consumers should be able to buy products like perfume and cologne tax-free starting next year when they're purchased directly from overseas buyers. The finance ministry said Wednesday it will submit a tax revision bill to the National Assembly to exempt taxes on goods valued at below 146 U.S. dollars that are imported by Korean residents for self-use. Currently, a special consumption tax of around 10 percent and two surtaxes are imposed on overseas purchases of products like perfumes and royal jelly. Now, a new study shows the majority of Koreans these days feel as though they're struggling to keep uh, pace with their neighbors. Our Kim Min-ji takes a look at what's making so many people in the country feel so insecure. Six out of every ten Koreans say they feel insecure about their socioeconomic status. In a survey conducted by the Korea Institute for Health and Social Affairs on 1,000 people, 60 percent of respondents said they felt unstable. Half of them said they felt quite unstable, 22 percent generally unstable, and 8 percent very unstable. Just 1 percent of those who responded said they felt very stable about their socioeconomic state. Then what is it making Koreans feel so unsteady? Insufficient income topped the list, followed by job insecurity, a growing distrust in society, a lack of government support, and health issues. As for everyday concerns, the respondents cited reasons ranging from their jobs and what they'll do post retirement to education, health, and safety. The feelings of socioeconomic insecurity aren't unwarranted. While the income of two person households in urban areas has risen 16 percent over the last five years, household spending has far outpaced it. As a result of increased spending on housing and education, the number of low and middle income households in debt has risen, with nearly 70 percent now having to pay off interest and principal. As of 2012, about 60 percent of households had an average debt of about 60,000 U.S. dollars. Kim Min Ji, Arirang News. Now, from bullying scandals and shooting sprees to suicides, the Korean military has been rocked by a spate of avoidable tragedies in recent months. This week alone, three soldiers have committed suicide, but this is certainly not a new problem for the military. Our Shin Se-min reports on what's being done to hopefully prevent similar tragedies happening again in the future. An Army private first class, previously identified as a soldier who required extra attention, committed suicide by shooting himself in the head during a live fire exercise on Tuesday. One day earlier, two Army corporals were found dead together in an apartment suicide while on furlough. 
Both were also classified as soldiers who needed extra supervision as they had exhibited suicidal tendencies in personality testing. In their suicide notes, the two whose names are being withheld from the media said they had been abused in their barracks, with one of them writing he even wanted to kill one of his superiors. These are the latest in a series of tragedies involving enlisted soldiers in recent weeks, all after experiencing physical and mental abuse often at the hands of their seniors. According to the military data, over 820 soldiers have taken their own lives since 2004. 47 of those cases have taken place this year. The Defense Ministry and new Army Chief Kim Yo-han have vowed to address the problem and reform military culture. They've promised a renewed focus on counseling and programs on suicide prevention and anti-bullying. But they'll need to fund their efforts. Of the military's budget of 35 billion U.S. dollars this year, just $123,000 went towards educating Korea's 600,000 troops through the types of programs and courses dedicated to preventing tragedies like these from occurring. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Well, it's time now for a look through the uh, international headlines we're following on this Wednesday afternoon. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim, who's standing by at the News Center. Eunice, the United States is beefing up its presence in Iraq, and it is now sending an additional 130 military personnel to the northern part of that country. That's right, Chinju. We're, of course, referring to the Kurdish part of Iraq, and U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel said they will be military advisors who will not engage in combat. The group of 130 are reported to be Marines and Special Ops Forces who will help assess the humanitarian situation there, working with the State Department as well as U.S. aid and international organizations to develop an appropriate humanitarian response. This, as the U.N. had said earlier, that tens of thousands of Yazidis are still trapped on Mount Sinjar and in grave need of food, water and shelter. U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon described their plight as, quote, especially harrowing as he urged world leaders to do more to help. And on the political front, pressure for Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki to step down is growing yet. One of his biggest supporters, Iran, has announced it now backs Prime Minister-designate Haider al-Abadi. This as U.S. Vice President Joe Biden urges Kurdish leaders to work with Abadi. Now, Abadi has 30 days to pull together a cabinet and form a new government. The Ebola outbreak has claimed its first European casualty. 75-year-old Spanish missionary priest Miguel Pajares passed away yesterday after being administered the test drug ZMAP three days earlier. He had contracted the contagious hemorrhagic virus while serving in Liberia. This has the World Health Organization approved the use of experimental drugs in the treatment of Ebola patients. Following discussions amongst medical experts, the WHO concluded it is ethical to use unlicensed medication in light of the sheer scale of this outbreak and the number of deaths, which has now exceeded 1,000. The maker of the test serum, ZMAP, said it has now run out of the test serum after its final doses were sent to a West African nation. Liberia confirmed it is the recipient of those doses, which it said would be used to treat two infected doctors who would be the first Africans to receive the treatment. And hundreds of unmarked white trucks are headed for Ukraine from Russia after Kiev cleared the Red Cross for a humanitarian mission participated by Russia, the EU and the U.S. But the convoy raised concerns even as it left Moscow to the rebel-held city of Luhansk in eastern Ukraine as the West is concerned that it may be a cover for an invasion. Russia insists the trucks hold hundreds of tons of grain, baby food and medicine for civilians trapped in the fighting. The Red Cross has said it needs more information and security guarantees from Moscow, while Ukraine says all aid must be delivered by the International Red Cross. And preliminary results of a forensic examination have showed that American actor and comedian Robin Williams likely ended his life 
by hanging himself. The 63-year-old Oscar winner, who had been battling severe depression as of late, was discovered by his personal assistant in his bedroom Monday local time in a seated position with a belt around his neck. Remembered also as an enthusiastic giver, Williams had struggled with substance abuse throughout his career. Sheriff's officials said toxicology results will likely take three to six weeks. It's quite dusty today here in Seoul, and as the level of dust particles are higher than usual, uh, ultra-fine dust advisor could be issued if it gets a bit higher than right now. And as we head into the midday, the whole nation should see more clouds coming in, with regions down south receiving showers from this evening. So 5 to 20 millimeters are expected for the central parts of the nation, while the heavier showers are in store for regions down south. And it's likely to rain till Friday, while the more northern areas will see rain on Sunday afternoon. So Liberation Day on Friday and Pope Francis beatification ceremony on Saturday morning will be rain-free here in Seoul. And for today, due to cloud coverage, nationwide temperatures will be lower than yesterday, as the high in the capital will be 27 and Daegu will get up to 20. 29, while Gwangju and Busan will rise to 28 this afternoon. And for other regions, Jeju Island and Daejeon will top out at 28 and 27. That's all for me at this hour. Have a wonderful day. Well, thank you very much, Jion, for the weather there. And those are the stories we're following at this hour. Mark and I will be back at the same time on Thursday. Thank you for watching.